Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, apparently, I'm the last talk between now and the evening events. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, a survey of disaster recovery approaches for OpenStack deployments. And the outline and objective of this talk is first to ensure that we have some common terminology on what exactly we mean by DR disaster recovery. I've seen disaster recovery for OpenStack talking about things like how to deal with a device failure or how to deal with a software failure. And I want to talk about a somewhat different aspect of disaster recovery. Uh, talk a little bit about key concepts of recovery time objective, recovery point objective, uh, the importance of consistency and different types of consistency that can play in DR solutions, uh, and support that one may have from the underlying storage. Then I want to go over three different approaches to providing disaster recovery <clears throat> for workloads running on OpenStack infrastructure. A generic approach, which uses only OpenStack mechanisms, makes no assumptions on the application and no assumptions on the underlying uh, storage infrastructure. An application-specific approach, which makes certain assumptions on the application and requires the cooperation of the application. And a, what I called here an advanced approach, but one that takes advantage of certain assumptions on the storage infrastructure. And then finally, I want to compare these approaches and raise for consideration some things we may want to see in OpenStack in the future to better support disaster recovery. So let's start with what is disaster recovery. And I took here a uh, definition. This is the definition that was in the abstract. It comes from Wikipedia. Disaster recovery is the process, policies, and procedures for recovery of technology infrastructure after a natural or human-induced disaster. Let's look at the, this definition in a little more detail. So natural or human-induced disaster. What type of disasters are we talking about? We're talking about things like floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, potentially even volcanoes, uh, poisoning events, fires, terrorism, things that can take out an entire data center. So we're not worried about a device failing, a server failing, a localized software failing. We're worried about a data center being unusable, either permanently or for a significant period of time, and the need to move the work over to another data center in order to continue operations. So surviving a disaster requires geographic dispersion, right? We can't survive a disaster, at least the types of disasters we're talking about here, within a single data center because the assumption is a disaster takes out a data center. Technology infrastructure, right? Business continuity is involved with the survival of the overall business. Disaster recovery is looking simply at the technology infrastructure, the, the IT component of the business. But it's looking at all of the IT component, the servers, the storage, the network, the software, the configuration, everything related to the IT. In the interest of time and to enable a focus, I'm going to, in this presentation, be focusing mostly on the storage aspect. Storage aspect is critical because that's the persistent state. That's what's changing as the application modifies its state, and it's what needs to be uh, dispersed and replicated if you want to be able to survive that disaster. Finally, the processes, policies, and procedures for recoveries. And these processes, policies, and procedures for recovery have three different elements. There's what do you do before the disaster, what do you do when the disaster happens, and what do you do after the disaster. Now, if we look in more detail of what do you do up front, this is the good path. This is when everything's working fine. It, too, has multiple elements. There's planning, figuring out what data needs to be copied, what data needs to be geographically dispersed, uh, how do you copy that data. Um, and testing it, making sure your solution actually works. Um, and there are various ways you can look at copying the data. You could look at a continuous approach, where data is all the time being copied by the system, or a periodic approach, where once a day, once a week, once every six hours, data is uh, copied. Now, a continuous approach can either be synchronous, in which all updates to your primary data are replicated to a remote site, to your secondary data center, are geographically dispersed before that write actually is completed back up to the host, back to the guest, the application making the write, or asynchronous, in which a write occurs, is completed from the application's perspective, and then at some point in the future, 
that data will be replicated to the remote site. Or it could be done periodic, and the periodic can be done online, transferring the data over a network, or offline, right? There are still many DR solutions out there where people put the data on tape, you know, a daily backup goes onto a tape, and that tape is shipped off-site, and that is a form of DR solution, right? Then there's detection. I have to be able to figure out a disaster is occurring and respond to that disaster. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to go to the next step, which is recovery. And the recovery involves recovering the infrastructure, and it reco involves recovering the application. I need to make sure that at my recovery site, my secondary data center, which is now becoming my production data center, I have all the necessary infrastructure up there and operational. And you know, depending on the solution that I've deployed, I may have that infrastructure operational all the time, or I may need to go and buy new servers, or lease new servers, or bring in new servers from somewhere, or new storage, and get the infrastructure up. And then once I have that infrastructure, I need to get the applications up and running. One key concept, or two key concepts, in particular, when I'm planning for my DR solution, I need to consider something that's called the recovery point objective and the recovery time objective. Recovery point objective, or RPO, is how far back in time a disaster is going to take me. In other words, how much data I've lost, how much work I've lost. And the closer that that recovery point objective gets to zero, in general, the more expensive the solution is, right? If I'm doing something where I'm doing a backup, putting it on tape, and once a week shipping that tape off site, my recovery point objective is going to be one week. It's a relatively inexpensive solution, but I lose a lot of data when there's a disaster. If I want a recovery point objective of zero, that means any updates that I've made to my persistent state, anything that's been written to the storage is guaranteed to survive a disaster. I need to have a synchronous solution in which every write is copied from the primary data center to the secondary data center as part of the actual uh, process of having that host write that data. That's the only way to guarantee that no data gets lost. Now, as I said, the lower the recovery point objective gets, the more expensive the solution gets. Some workloads require an RPO of zero, some don't. Recovery time objective. How long does it take me to get operational after I had a disaster, right? It may take me, you know, if I have a, a, a hot data center with servers sitting there running, my application's already loaded into VMs, everything already there, sitting there just ready to go and start working, I can have an RTO that approximates zero. In practice, I'm not sure you can ever actually get to an RTO of zero, um, but I can get fairly close to zero. But that can be really expensive because basically I need everything sitting there running, ready to take over, just in the event that I have a disaster. So I've basically doubled the costs. On the other hand, if I don't have any remote site, I just have a bunch of tapes sitting somewhere, right? I'm going to have a very long RTO because I'm going to have to go find a data center, I'm going to have to go find servers, I'm going to have to load the data from tapes and so on, right? And these tapes, you know, I'm using tapes as a concept here. These can be virtual tapes. They can be a set of disks that have been put offline. They don't actually have to be physical tapes. A third concept that's really important to consider is the consistency of the data. What is the state of my data at the recovery site when I need to go and recover? And the easiest way to explain this is to have sort of a conceptual application. And here we have an application that has a set of transactions, and each transaction, it writes a piece of data to, to volume one and then to volume two. So up at the top, you know, it writes A to volume one and then writes B to volume two in that first transaction. Then it writes C to volume two and D to volume one in the you know, second transaction and so on. And there are multiple states that are possible of the data at the secondary site because the data is being written to multiple volumes which are independent entities. So we could have a situation at the secondary site where on volume one, we had A and D, and on volume two, we had B. Now, this is inconsistent. It's inconsistent because uh, there is no logical flow of the application where this could have occurred, and this happens if, for instance, volume one was copied, uh, sorry, if volume two was copied, and then at some later point in time, volume one was copied, right? That I, in other words, I've made the copies of the volumes at logically different points in time. Second type of consistency we consider is power fail consistency. In power fail consistency, I have a state of the data at my recovery site 
that could have happened had there been an instantaneous power failure at the primary site. And most serious applications know how to recover from a power outage. And so this is a state of data that most applications know how to recover from. Now, it may take a long time to recover from them. If it's a database, it needs to go and do a complete log replay, depending on the size of the log. File systems may need to do file system checks. So it can take time to recover, but applications should, in general, know how to recover from this state. The final type of consistency to call out here is what we call application consistency. And application consistency says, I have a state of the data at the secondary site that is semantically meaningful to the application. So here, for instance, we see we have a complete transaction and only complete transactions. Now, to get application consistency, you need some hook into the application, right? So Microsoft has VSS. You know, there are various applications that have various hooks where the code responsible for the replication can inform the application it wants a consistent view of the data and uh, enforce that the data that gets replicated is at a consistent point in time. Now, having application consistency, you're not going to be able to get to an RPO uh, of zero because not all points in time are application consistent. Finally, let me talk a little bit about storage system support. And I'm going to talk about this uh, more from the perspective of a storage controller, but some of this stuff could be done in principle at the level of, of uh, you know, software solutions. So many storage systems, in fact, most storage subsystems today uh, support synchronous replication. And in synchronous replication, it's the responsibility of the storage subsystem to ensure that data is replicated as part of writing that data. And in synchronous replication, the data is hardened at the remote site prior to an act of a host write going back to the act of a write going back to the host. And this enables a RPO of zero. So here our host is writing A, that data goes to the primary copy. The storage system will copy that data to the secondary, get back an ACK from the secondary. Only after that has been ACT will it give the ACK back to the uh, host. Uh, this enables, as I said, you know, a, 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 an RPO of zero because every write is replicated as part of the process of the application doing the write. And before the application proceeds to the next write, it knows that its prior write exists at both data centers. In asynchronous replication, data is copied after the act. It's not copied as part of the actual write but copied after the act, and this guarantees that the recovery point objective is going to be greater than zero. With asynchronous replication, when there is a disaster, there will be data loss, right? So with asynchronous replication, the host write, the primary storage gives back an acknowledgement to the host. At some later point in time, that data will be replicated over to the secondary site and act back to the primary. Now, another concept that most storage subsystems have is a concept of consistency groups. It's a set of volumes which it will ensure their replicas are maintained in a power fail consistent state at the remote site. And consistency groups are essential when you're dealing with asynchronous replication. For some of the corner cases, they're also important for synchronous replication. But it's a basic feature that exists in many storage subsystems. Uh, and as I said, these features are, you know, not unique to any one particular product. It's something that's fairly common in storage subsystems today. Okay, so with that as background, how can we provide DR for an OpenStack environment? As I said, I want to talk about three different approaches. A generic approach, which uses only OpenStack mechanisms, makes no assumptions on what the application can do, and makes no assumption on any support from the storage subsystems. A application-specific approach, which is tied to the behavior of specific guests, and an approach that leverages storage subsystem support. And then each of these approaches can be evaluated on five different parameters. What type of recovery point objective they support, what type of recovery time objectives they support, and so in other words, how much data is lost, how long it takes us to get back to being operational, what sort of consistency model they support, Port, and then two other approaches, which are you know, fairly self-describing, how complex is it to implement the solution, and how generic is the solution. 
Okay, so let's start with the generic approach. Um, here, the assumption is we, you know, in, the, in this example, we have a VM. Attached to this VM are two volumes which have been provisioned via Cinder. Uh, the VM has been provisioned via Nova. We also have a Swift installation at a remote data center. So we have our you know, production data center, a primary site which has the VM and the two volumes attached to it, and Swift at the secondary site. So one way we could achieve DR is by taking advantage of Nova Snapshot to snapshot that VM and copying the application persistent data. Right? So we would issue a Nova Snapshot to the VM. This should then go and invoke Cinder Snapshot first on volume one, then on volume two. So I've now snapshotted and copied essentially the two volumes attached to that VM. But there's a problem, right? What is the problem? Those copies are inconsistent, right? Additional writes that are dependent upon one another could have entered to the volumes between the snapshot of volume one and the snapshot of volume two, which can give me a state that's inconsistent. After I have those snapshots, I can then go in and create a volume from the snapshots within Cinder. And then once I have those volumes, and, and this can be done in any particular order. There's not an issue of inconsistency here because those snapshots are not being modified. Once I have those volumes, I can go and back them up via the mechanism that was added into Grizzly to back up a volume to Swift. Uh, and again, this can be done in any order because those volumes are not attached. They're not being modified. But this brings up another issue. This is going to cause a very high recovery point objective because each time I want to create a copy of the data at my remote site, basically have a, you know, the ability to survive from some point in time, I'm copying the entire volumes, all of the persistent data. So I'm copying a huge amount of data potentially. And if I'm copying a lot of data, I can only do that so often, which can lead to a fairly high recovery point objective. Okay, so after a disaster at the secondary, I recover the volumes, right? I can recover from the backups in Swift to two volumes that can then be managed by Cinder. And this brings up the third issue with this solution. It's a high recovery time objective, right? I'm recovering an entire volume, copying an entire volume of data out of Swift into the volumes that are managed by Cinder. If there's a large amount of data, this is going to be time consuming. After I have the data back in the volumes, well, then I can go and restart a VM, reattach the volumes to VM, and get back up and you know, running on my recovery site. Now, I've skipped a lot of steps here. Right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done here. As I said, I was focusing on storage. But clearly, we need to copy the images from Glance. We need to have the images at both sites. We need to ensure that the uh, network configuration, the quantum configuration, is cloned and appropriate and managed at the remote site so we set up. You know, we're not dealing typically with a single VM, but with a collection of VMs. Uh, we need to make sure the Nova configuration is correctly managed. And we need to make sure that the Cinder configuration is, is correctly managed. And clearly, there's a lot of additional work here. A second approach is the application-specific approach, right? Having disaster recovery using guest-provided mechanisms. And in this case, the assumption is the application knows how to provide DR for itself. So for instance, databases often know how to do this for, by example, shipping a log. So if I do a database update at one site, the database can be hooked up with a copy of itself running at another site where any updates to the log at a primary site will be shipped off to the database at the secondary site, and then those log updates will be applied at the secondary site. And the way this would work in an open stack environment is that an admin would need to provision the VM or VMs, plus the storage, plus the network at both the primary and secondary site. In other words, the, v, the admin is going to be setting up the normal OpenStack mechanisms, the workload to run at the primary site, and the workload to run at the secondary site. Then the admin needs to configure the application to say that this is my primary copy, this is my secondary copy, and that's done completely outside of the scope of OpenStack. OpenStack is completely unaware of this. And then the admin needs to start the workload at the primary and the secondary. After it's started, the user interacts with the primary, and it's completely at the application level that the data gets transferred from the primary to the secondary site. There's no involvement of OpenStack in this. When a disaster occurs, the admin 
again, without any involvement of OpenStack, needs to configure the secondary as the new production workload. And the application will perform any additional cleanup it needs to do to start you know, working as the production. And then the user starts interacting with the secondary. So what do we see here, right? What are the benefits? Application-based recovery can give us good RPO, good recovery point objective, good recovery time objective, and, and good consistency, right? But the drawback and the key assumption here is it depends on the application, right? There are only certain applications that support application-level DR. For instance, enterprise databases, and it's not a generic solution, right? And it works only within the confines of that application. I can't get cross-application consistency. So if I have a workload that consists of some homegrown application or some other application that doesn't support application-level DR, plus a database that does, even if my database does it, I'm not going to have consistency across those two parts of the workload. Then the final thing to call out here is um, disaster recovery using storage functions, right? And there's several ways we can do this. Uh, one is we could use pools of prepared volumes. So essentially the idea here is the admin, prior to giving storage over to Cinder to manage, would at both the primary site and the secondary site provision volumes and set up a copy relationship between them, either a synchronous replication or an asynchronous replication between these volumes. These volumes would need to be provisioned as, at the storage level, either as very th as thinly provisioned or auto-expand because we don't know what the size is. Then we would have the Cinder driver, give the driver for the particular storage in Cinder uh, access to this pool. And when there's a provisioning request that comes in, the Cinder driver would take a pair out of this pool and essentially give it to the application. Now, from this higher level Cinder perspective, it's only giving the volume at the primary site. But what it's actually doing is taking a pair and inside that Cinder driver, managing that pool. So each time it comes, a provision request comes in, it's going to be giving one of these pools, and that's what gets given up to the higher uh, level. Second way we can do this is by externally creating the volumes on demand at both sites and then externally doing the, the defining the relationship for the replication at the storage level. This requires an external communication pipe between the admin at the primary site and the secondary site, and obviously this could be the same person, right? Uh, and what would happen is OpenStack is invoked independently at both sites. A volume is provisioned at the primary site, it's provisioned at the secondary site through a Cinder, via Cinder. Those are normal OpenStack mechanisms to provision. Then outside of OpenStack, those two volumes get tied together. And uh, you know, we need to externally manage that replication. And in the event of a disaster, you know, all of that gets done outside of OpenStack. So we would provision at the primary site, tell the admin at the secondary site to go ahead and provision, provision at the secondary site, and tie those together. Right? And we would do this for each volume we wanted to provision. Now, even more than with the generic approach where I hand waved and skipped a lot of the details, here there are even more details that are being skipped. And the details here end up being to some degree dependent on the details of the particular storage implementation, whatever's sitting behind that Cinder management driver. Uh, but there's also a lot of details on everything that's you know, beyond simply getting the persistent data from the production site to the secondary site. So you know, we need to probably place the databases on replicated storage if we want to ensure the configurations are replicated. Uh, and you know, this could be realistic if we're using storage level replication. But in all of these things, the devil is in the, the, the details. OK, so let's go through a quick comparison of the approaches as they are today. So if we look at the generic approach, it's weak in terms of the recovery point objective, the recovery time objective, and consistency. In fact, consistency could be a sufficiently large problem in many use cases to make it actually not usable, right? Most workloads can't recover from an inconsistent state. Uh, its complexity is moderate. The reason I put its complexity as moderate is there's no automation, no scripting for it there. But this could be overcome, I believe. And by definition, 
it's really good in being generic, right? It makes no assumptions other than the assumptions on OpenStack. Uh, if we look at application specific, it can have really good recovery point objective, really good recovery time objective, really good consistency. That's sort of what it's built for, right? Its complexity, again, is moderate. Where the complexity actually is will depend on the details of the specific application and how that application manages it. But by definition, it's not generic. It only works with that specific application, and you have to do something different for every different type of application. Finally, looking at the storage-based approaches, they have good RPO, RTO consistency, and these are the approaches and the mechanisms that are used by banks, for instance, to, to replicate financial transactions. So they've got all of this stuff for, 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 for you know, being you know, no loss of data, um, being able to get you know, app and working quickly and being consistent, but they can be fairly complicated to manage, and there is no way to integrate them today into OpenStack, and what I showed before with you know, either pools of paired volumes or doing it outside of OpenStack, this is not for the faint of heart um, and would not be easy to put together. And the approaches are moderately generic in that, you know, on a given storage implementation, any application will work. So once you've done it for one application, you've done it for all applications because they're working at the storage level. They're not working at an application level. Okay. So, where I think we would like to get to is probably improving the generic approach in terms of its RPO, its RTO, and its consistency. It'll probably never be, um, you know, if we need to be completely generic and not take advantage of any knowledge of the storage or any knowledge of the application, we're probably never going to get to pure green on those places. Uh, we probably need to reduce the complexity of all of the solutions. Uh, and um, you know, we're never going to get to be more generic in terms of the application specific or the, the, the storage you know, based approaches. So some thoughts, and you know, I think we'll have some time, so I'd like to hear here also what others in the audience think uh, we might want to do, but you know, some thoughts on what we might want from OpenStack. So first off, I think consistency groups could be very useful to have in OpenStack, an ability to define a set of volumes where I want to make a consistent snapshot of that set of volumes, right? And these set of volumes can be attached to one VM or multiple VMs, but I'd like to you know, be able to snapshot those volumes in such a way that I have power fail consistency on that collection of snapshots. Second, incremental copy of snapshots to Swift. So if I'm backing up data into Swift, looking at that generic approach, if I have the ability to incrementally copy the data, not copy an entire snapshot, and backing up an entire volume, but just copy what's changed since the last time I did it, maybe as a delta object, right? That can greatly improve my recovery point objective because then I'm able to do this snapshotting and this backing up into Swift much more frequently. Finally, not finally, uh, the flip side of that is incremental restore of snapshots from Swift. So if I, at my secondary site, recovered a base version of the volume from Swift into a volume managed by Cinder, and then I had a incremental update, I'd like to be able to retrieve from Swift and apply only that incremental update. So basically just taking what's changed, backing it up, and taking what's changed and restoring it, as opposed to doing a complete backup and a complete restore. In terms of complexity, I think we need some automation of setup, of recovery, of testing, right, for a DR solution. You don't want to have everyone who's doing a DR solution basically start from scratch. Uh, and I think we need the ability in, through a standard mechanism to integrate with storage level replication functions and consistency groups. So if the storage system, whatever it may be, supports these features, uh, allow them to be taken and driven by OpenStack in a way that OpenStack, because it's driving it, can integrate with Nova and with Quantum. And finally, I think we need a generic mechanism to support replicating of project DBs and images of Glance independent of the mechanism for replicating the persistent state that's modified uh, by the application. So with that, uh, I'd be happy for questions and be very happy to hear if people have views or opinions on other ways of doing things or what else they might want to see.
And just so you know, I can barely see anyone. <laughs> um, So if OpenStack replicated, well, mirrored, but, so, so it, the, the, that would help. It could help in some ways. Um, you would need to go, I mean, if, you, if you're replicating all of the writes going down to the volume is underneath OpenStack today, right? Because the, the hypervisor is going directly to the storage. It's not going through OpenStack on the persistent writes. Um, you would need to make sure that your primary and your secondary sites are close enough that you could do that synchronously as part of the um, operation done by the host, but it would definitely help such, help such a mechanism. Loic? Yeah, if, if you use SEP instead of SWIFT, uh, you have a bit that if the incremental copy that's used here, you already have it. So Cinder's backup doesn't support that today. This is not a swift statement as much as how do you have the whole flow together. If Cinder would do an incremental backup, then doing the incremental restore would be easier. And you know, Cinder's backup mechanism today is written such that it can work with multiple backends. So it would be nice to have a backend other than Swift for the backup. Can you elaborate on what you? So let's say uh, on a front end side, I have a VM leader. Right. And in that VM leader, I replicate it across. Do I need to have an ESX environment? Yeah, you need to have, I mean, to make the problem tractable, you need to have a certain degree of similarity of the infrastructure, at least that part of the infrastructure you want to support. So you need to be using the same hypervisor. Um, at both sites. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be using the same storage architecture. For instance, if you go with the generic approach, uh, part of the value of the generic approach is you could use heterogeneous storage at the two sites. But I don't see it as being tractable to use different storage, uh, different hypervisors. So, so what I think you're addressing is how we could do the integration with a storage level replication um, by having an abstraction through uh, Cinder where it would uh, be able to provision a volume which could be replicated and then Cinder could know that this volume is replicated? Did I understand that? Right, I think ideally this should, right. I think ideally this should be done in such a way though that it wouldn't necessarily require only a storage array. Something that should work well with storage arrays, but if you know, there was a software-based implementation, it could work with that as well. Okay, I'd be happy to hear a little bit more afterwards. I'd be happy to discuss this more with you afterwards. Other questions? Replicating the what images? The blue disks. So, so yeah, I mean, I pointed out that I didn't really 
that I really was focusing on the, the persistent storage attached to the applications, but I, we need to replicate, you know, Glance needs to be replicated or, you know, stored in some third location, have its, it, it, its, its persistent data stored in some third location. So both the secondary site, both the primary site and the secondary site have access to those images. Oh, the boot? Okay. Um, no, I don't think you need to do a, a, a replication of the boot image itself. Uh, if, you know, in general, I don't think you need to do an application of the boot image. You have a good point. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that needs to be done is look at how these applications, one does DR for these applications without OpenStack um, and not reinvent the wheel. I think in many cases, these applications, if they're going to be doing DR, aren't going to be booting from a local device. And so the issue may be then having the ability to boot from non-local devices, which is there, and then treat those non-local devices as the same way you treat the rest of the persistent storage. Would you be supporting OpenStack to boot from single vault? Um, the support, I believe, is there, but insufficient. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm specifically was here in this presentation was looking at what happens when a data center goes belly up. Not a server fails or a device fails or some piece of software fails, but the entire data center and, and focusing on the situation where geographic dispersion is inherently necessary in order to address the problem. That is correct. But mechanisms that solve HA don't necessarily work for, for DR. I'm sure you have read a lot about the latest uh, white papers on what needs to be done from, for cloud DR, particularly in the, let's say, from Amazon. Mm -hmm. Right. right, so Amazon leaves a lot of stuff to you, but it also says if you want to do this, take your EBS volumes and back them up to S3, right? Because the EBS volumes don't have DR and S3 does, right? And so if you looked at the generic approach I talked about, it was basically saying take the Cinder volumes, what's akin to EBS, and copy them over to Swift, which is what's akin to S3. So that generic approach is very much aligned with what you just described. Okay. And then the other thing I said was well, it would be really nice to have some automation around this, some scripts, such that it wasn't all done manually, right? Amazon leaves an awful lot to you. And there's a large community that's developed around you know, tools and extra, you know, utilities that you can buy that automate this stuff, right? And well, th there is value in that. You know, it's not a completely absurd approach. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>